Good day. Um, my, uh, this, welcome to the International Association of this, for the Study of the Commons third annual World Commons Week event. My name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the United States. I'm a member of the International Association for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm the organizer of the World Commons Week 2020 event. As you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice and has two primary components. One is uh, coordinated local events around the world, and the second is a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. Today, is, uh, this, this is the keynote webinar for the IESC Oceana region where Dr. Ann Polina will be presenting a new 35-minute documentary film followed by a brief question and answer period. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Polina, as well as Professor Andreas Neef of the University of Auckland, ISC, who is also IASC's regional coordinator for Oceana and uh, organized this webinar. Um, to ensure the webinar functions well, we've limited video to the speaker and the moderator and the audio for attendees are muted. Um, you do have the ability to ask a question anytime. Um, the way you do that is at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A function. If you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see Q&A. And you can type in your questions there. And Andreas and I will monitor those questions. Uh, our plan is to read those questions to Dr. Polina after the film is completed. If it appears that you need to have a dialogue between you and the speaker, we'll, we'll unmute you. So let me now turn to Andreas um, to welcome our speaker, Andreas. Thank you, Charlie. Tena koucho katoa and welcome to this keynote webinar at, of the Oceania Regional Chapter of the IASC. My name is Andreas Neef and I'm teaching in the Development Studies Program at the University of Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Anne Paulina as the keynote speaker for this event and is the managing director of Majala, Majala Incorporated. She's an Australian indigenous multidisciplinary scientist. She holds a doctor of philosophy and three master's degrees, a master's of arts in indigenous social policy, a master of education, and a master of public health and tropical medicine. And amazingly, she's about to submit her second doctoral thesis for a doctor of philosophy in health science, focusing on indigenous well-being in transition. Anne is an active community leader. She's a human rights and earth rights advocate, a filmmaker and a respected academic researcher. She's currently an adjunct senior research fellow with Notre Dame University. Anne is also a visiting fellow with the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University in Canberra, where she works on the development and implementation of the Water Justice Hub. She's a 2011 Peter Cullen Fellow for Water Leadership and is a signatory to the Redstone Statement that she helped draft at the first International Summit on Indigenous Environmental Philosophy in 2010. In 2017, Anne was awarded a laureate from the Women's World Summit Foundation in Geneva. She's a team member of the Commons Cluster of the United Nations NGO Major Group. Her work is truly transdisciplinary and fuses first law, culture, earth science, political science, as well as economic and earth-centered governance in the sharing and guardianship of our commons for the greater good of humanity and the planet. Her keynote will focus on her sacred river, the Matuvara, also known as the Fitzroy River in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. And it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to have you give this keynote. And I will now hand over to you. And I understand you will commence with a welcome to country in your beautiful language. Yes. Mabungimbi. Najikorijan Nyambuburu Yaru. Ngayo imaru waramanen, nga manda jara nyigana, nga nyigana nganga, nga nganga mabo ngorigen muja. So um, in my language, I just said, I'm good morning, mabo ngimbi, good morning. It's morning here and I know it's mabo bayan, which is good evening for Charles. Um, 
look, this is a great honor for me to be able to share. And, um, you know, uh, one of the big things in all of this is that we're trying to get the world and humanity to think of we, not me. Um, I also think that this is a fantastic opportunity to share, um, you know, with those of you that are hopefully going to ask me some uh, really pointed questions at the end, but I just thought um, I would put together a film, which is a compilation of some of the things that will be seen in my uh, PhD, which is about poems, about song, about story, um, and bring that all together in a celebration that the Matawara, the Fitzroy River is globally unique. It is an asset in common that belongs to all of us. So from that perspective, the Matawara is the lifeblood of the Kimberley. Um, and we really need to make sure that we can share this work globally. So it's about earth-centered governance from the oldest living cultures and societies in the world. And in a time when not only does indigenous and black lives matter, but indigenous wisdom matters. And if we're dealing with complexity, we need to ensure that the wisdom of indigenous people from whatever lands we are coming from is front and center in terms of the collaborative spirit that's required for all of us to work together to ensure that we produce and sustain harmony. So from that perspective, um, thank you all for being there with you all. and. Um, Thanks to Andreas and Charlie for helping me through this process. Uh, to my son, who's a fabulous storyteller and his voice is also part of this, um, who helped right size a little bit of chaos a little earlier. I just want you to sit back, think about this, feel the country, feel the country because the country is feeling you. This is um, the country, the river is an active actor in all of our work. And in two recent uh, publications, one of them has the Matawara Fitzroy River as the lead author. So there's legal scholarly work out there in terms of pushing the boundaries of how we need to bring in this sort of uh, legal pluralism and transformation so that we can right size the planet. Um, just in closing, one of the things I say is that we are all indigenous to Mother Earth. We all need to make this our home. We all need to encompass an ethics of care and love. Somebody said to me that you won't protect anything you don't love. So I hope at the end of this uh, 35 minute presentation, there's a feeling that we must do better, that we can do better. And with the work that I'm doing nationally, globally, we are on a journey of building a coalition of hope. I've also left my email and our website and I'm saying what is actually happening in this area is world's best practice for humanity. So thank you all and please watch the film and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Andreas and Charlie. Thank you, Anne. I'm going to now um, pause the, uh, the recording, okay? Um, give me a second. Oh, Andreas, I can't do it. Oh, yes, I can, okay. <laughs> so I just turned the recording back on. Right. And Andreas and I will monitor the Q and A. Um, so, uh, people, we have a very nice audience. Uh, feel free to put questions at the bottom of your screen. You should have a Q and A function. Uh, feel free to ask questions there, or if you can't find the Q and A, use chat. Andreas, there's a couple questions in chat. So there's a question from Georgina. Could you talk briefly about a transdisciplinary research process that you have been involved with that have successfully integrated indigenous science and what approaches were taken, such as scenario planning, knowledge sharing, qualitative modeling? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I think right now um, we're just about to publish um, the Matawara Fitzroy River Council Conservation and Management Plan for the whole of the Fitzroy catchment. So that's been a, a very big uh, dialogic process where we've worked with a whole range of uh, transdisciplinary science, also legal scholars in terms of developing this plan, which is ready to be launched um, on the 31st of October. So that's the profound body of uh, knowledge and information that is now being produced as it's just completed peer review. So that is possibly um, 
the greatest bit of work that I could uh, share with all of you um, in regard to that process. So yes, watch this space. Uh, 31st of October, we will be launching the Matawara Fitzroy River catchment management plan for the whole of the Fitzroy River. What's really profound about this body of work is yes, it has incorporated a whole range of transdisciplinary scientists, but the most important thing is privileging first law, law of the land, law not of man. So it's a very aspirational document. We believe that the time is right for such a statement. And so that body of work is, is, has just finished peer review 24 hours ago and will be out there published. Also, um, in terms of this, if you contact me, I've got a whole range of um, publications that have emanated out of the PhD study, and I will be happy to share them with anyone um, who requests that. So thank you for that question, but the profound document is just about to be released within the next couple of weeks. Watch this space. Then there's a question from Bradley. Could you speak more to the legal and symbolic process of getting the Matovara River to be recognized as an individual? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is the fact that we're working with complexity. And so you saw that in 2016, there was for the first time an opportunity to have a tribunal for nature in Australia. And so part of all of this is also politics and theater the biggest challenge is how do we bring the people with us? So we had the Tribunal for Nature. We had the Fitzroy River Declaration that was declared very soon after that. And that is the first time Indigenous law and ecological earth jurisprudence law have come together to forge this instrument. So the Matawara Fitzroy River Declaration is a document of that standing. And um, I think this is a very, very big conversation because what we're saying is that in order to bring about justice for indigenous people in our country, we really need to seriously examine um, all of the confluences that impact on um, Aboriginal people's right for justice. And so it's a very complicated area. Um, as I said, we see time in a circular way. So my challenge is to do my bit and to work with legal scholars and be advised by very senior counsel that the work that we are doing is profound and the, the feedback from both constitutional uh, QCs and native title QCs is the work that's just been published last week with the Matawara Fitzroy River as the lead author is a profound body of information that needs to inform the judiciary. So it's a long process. I'm working with legal scholars. This film that we're producing, also launching on the 31st of October, is a film that documents the, the uh, triangulation of Indigenous senior law holders, law makers, who have come together in unity to really showcase the Walangari, the river law song. So for the whole of the Fitzroy River, there is a song which is, uh, holds the, the first law, and that, that will be communicated. So one of the things I said is that we're publishing this sort of legal pluralism and this journey through a range of multiple ways of storing, including film, including the declaration, including public um, peer reviewed documents, but also submissions to the federal and state government in regards to how this legal reform needs to proceed. And one of the things that indigenous people are very, very conscious about is the way that we hold the frame that land, water, people and communities are intrinsically entwined. But what we see in our nation state is that the legislation is very, very um, separated. There's no opportunity to bring all those forms of legislation together. And so right now today, I'm just in the middle of submitting um, those of you that are aware globally, the destruction of the Jugan Gorge Caves, a couple of um, almost a couple of months ago and how people around the world really looked at that situation and were quite disturbed by the actions of, of the state and our procedural unfair justice that's bringing about those sorts of things. So it's a constant process of creating the dialogue, making sure it's evidence-based, checking the validity of that with senior legal people who are saying, yes, you're on track or no, you're off track. But the most important point comes from um, Professor Irene Watson, is, who's saying that just because these laws exist, let's not leave the status quo. 
as thinking people, we need to challenge the, the level of structural violence, the systemic racism in terms of laws and legislation. And we as living witness to this level of um, anti-dialogic processes need to be leading this. This needs to be Indigenous led. So we are working and the two papers that I've just published will show that it is Indigenous people, First Nations people globally that are leading the advocacy and the transformation of Earth jurisprudence because what we're finding when we look at this globally and the IPBES report also frames it in this way is that these last bastions of biodiversity have been held on Indigenous lands through the wise and good management of Indigenous people and this is where the transformation needs to happen because this is where the unjust invasive development continues to play out. So yeah, it's you know publishing in all of those different uh, areas. And as I said, there is an in, there is an invitation for those that are interested to contact me, and for me to be able to share those legal scholarly work. So happy to do that. Thank you. There's a question from Aroha. Um, what supports do you have for common law and natural law from the legal community? Uh, this is exactly the point I just made. Was that we are in, in developing. Um, the legal text, the legal scholarly work. I'm working with very senior and reputable um, earth jurisprudence lawyers from Australia and globally. And when we construct our work, I have also another network of very uh, eminent practitioners in constitutional law, in native title law, in common law, and the work that, they, that has just recently been put out, the feedback from all of these legal minds who are in the practice of transformational reform with the law is saying this is what the judiciary needs to see and read and be um, open-minded to. So those pieces of work, as I said earlier, is available for that, uh, for people who are interested in that body of work. There's a question from Kenneth who says, um, the video used the term earth jurisprudence. Within this framework, is there not a need to start a move from national sovereignty to the more fundamental notion of earth sovereignty. Yeah, no, this is the, this is the point of these two papers that have been published in this, um, this journal. What I said was the first paper that is the lead article in the special journal edition shows that we have looked globally out there to see what is happening in the world, what's happening in the Amazon, what's happening in Colombia, what's happening in First Nations country in the US. So um, rather than you know, elaborate on that, I think it's um, a necessity to get both papers because that shows that we can't just be talking about ecological earth jurisprudence without grounding that in a serious partnership with first law, law of the land, not law of man. And so we need to combine indigenous first law, customary law with common law and earth jurisprudence to get this transformation in our legal system. Then there's a question from Alan. How will the recent proposed Western Australian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill 2020 impact on your work? Yes, <laughs> very good question. And as I said, I'm in the moment right now. Today, I am finalizing my submission to, to the federal government. I really believe that we should not be doing a review. This whole process needs to be reformed. What can we learn from the destruction of the Jugan Gorge cave? And what that shows me as an Indigenous leader, an Indigenous person who's got extensive lived experience in having lived the journey of cultural violence from my great grandmother right down to me and to my daughter now, is saying is that we need to take a pause. We cannot afford to develop a bill that is going to, to present the illusion of probity. We really need to deconstruct the culture of violence that's occurring to Indigenous people in our land. And what we're saying is that Indigenous leaders are stepping up. We're saying, how do we do this in a collaborative spirit? But what we're seeing is that we're very, very concerned about the way this new bill has been restructured. We do not believe that um, the support is there for local representation. We see no guidelines, no framework, and yet we are expected as Indigenous leaders and Indigenous people to sign on to a reform process 
that gives us no benchmark for how this is going to be rolled out into the future. So um, I'm very concerned about it. I'm very worried about it. Um, the other day, 160 people wrote to the Minister for Indigenous Affairs to say that this is a, is a reform bill that's over 200 pages. Indigenous people, Indigenous leaders need more time, not four weeks, to be able to respond in a realistic way and work collaboratively with the government to say, these are the gaps. These are the gaps that we're currently seeing in the institutionalised process. We need an opportunity to put comments up, but um, I'm really saying that what we really need is an opportunity to have not review, but reform. Our previous Premier has called for a Royal Commission, but what we need to do is look at the, the um, integration of all forms of legislation that impact on our lives, that impact on, on the protection of our cultural heritage. And at the moment, Australia is fast tracking a process whereby we're shifting responsibility from the Commonwealth to the state governments. And what we see is that the state government is heavily conflicted because they need to work collaboratively with the mining companies to be able to generate the profits to sustain the state. So what we're saying is that if we're serious about reforming the new West Australian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Bill, then we need a serious way to be able to understand and provide Indigenous leaders, Indigenous people with a right to have and privilege our voices in the restructuring and the reformatting of this reform. This current review does not sit well with me, nor does it sit well with many, many other Indigenous leaders. We need to ensure that this is not an illusion of probity. If we're going to have real justice, then Aboriginal people, as Jonathan Hook said in there, not just be part of the talking, but a critical part of the decision making and the transformational change we need in our nation. The one point I want to leave with on that note is that what we're saying as Indigenous people is that our, um, our liberation, our freedom, our right to be heard is not just for Indigenous people. There is a real need for our nation state to redefine who we are as Australians in modernity and to look at governance and government and maybe rather than all the little piecemeal approaches, we need to be brave, we need to be confident that the citizens of our nation are ready to redefine who they are. We need to move forward in a spirit of collaboration and we must call not just for a review and reform of our bills, but we need to call for justice through a just republic process. Thank you. Next so question I'm, probably related to this. Um, sorry, Charlie. No, I was just going to break in because we were scheduled to end in about two minutes. Um, and I, uh, I but I, I know you both agreed to stay a little longer. I think we should just keep this going a little longer. And um, I, I wanted to recognize there's been a hand up in the participants window, Jay Miller. So I'm going to um, allow Jay Miller to talk and then we'll go back to the question and answer. Okay. Um, uh, maybe that maybe okay, the hands down. So let's go back to the question and answer and we'll stay we'll stay a bit longer. This is uh, wonderful. So Sabine asked, will this terrific film be shown on I NITV, SBS, ABC, and other TV channels? Will it be shared on the internet for further awareness raising and sharing? Um, it will be uh, available through the Commons process, through this engagement process. The film will be available. The film that I'm talking about in terms of the pivotal uh, documentation that's going to be part of the evidence base that we need for the legal pluralism, pluralism is called The Serpent's Tale. And so through um, this process, we will be launching an online uh, webinar, seminar presentation in about four to five weeks. And I hope that all of you watching will also connect to that because we're taking you right inside of country and to show the meaning of what law and earth-centered uh, law, particularly law of the land means. So um, this film that I've just shown, the 35 minute one, will be available on the Commons website uh, through Andreas and Charlie, but the big film will also keep you all noted uh, so that you can join us possibly in four to five weeks. Thank you. 
There's a question from Jenny. Um, the prioritization of economic development is so strong, as we see by the pressures on the river. So what strategies do you have to present a different understanding of economy to open an, up understandings of economies such as well-being? Yeah, no, this is very interesting. Um, I just had a colleague uh, that I was working with who's just finished her PhD looking at how do you put an economic value on culture and that culture mat matters and culture counts. So from that perspective, what we're framing is what we're calling the forever industries around the new economies. Culture, science, conservation. How do we start to bring people to a sense of place and well-being? How do we bring people to country um, in terms of um, eco-tourism, geo-heritage, biosphere reserves, there is amazing um, biodiversity, here, biodiversity here, but also, as we said earlier, you know, the oldest living societies in the world. And so there is an opportunity for Indigenous people and leaders to be able to share country uh, with visitors. But also what we're talking about in the forever economies is the conversation around renewable energy. We live it here in the north, in the Kimberley. We've got the capacity, if there was a goodwill from government, what we need to reach out to the private and philanthropic investors, such as what's happening in the Northern Territory, to say that we can create what we believe are the forever industries to transition from fossil fuel to these new economies. One of the things also for us is that we need to redefine labour and develop these diverse economies. We need to harness the human capital of our young people who have the highest suicide rate in the world and give them a sense of hope. How do we redefine labor? How do we create these diverse on economies on country? We then can move into bioprospecting in terms of the superfoods and the, the amazing um, botanicals and pharmaceuticals that we have on our land. We also need to proceed with caution in terms of copyright and patent and all of those sorts of things. But one of the things I talked about um, with someone else the other day is that we have one plant, this is just one plant, if we were to go down the bioprospecting route, one plant that has 30 times the property of morphine. It's also a natural antibiotic when we're talking about a time when we're becoming resistant to golden staph. So it's an antibiotic, it's an antiseptic, it's an analgesic. So we have these plants that are on our country that exist, superfoods, pharmaceuticals. Um, we need to make sure that we protect the patents and the IP and the value of that. And that if we are going to partner with, in, with um, private and philanthropic, how do we look at benefit sharing? How does that work in a commons area that all traditional owners are connected to in terms of these sorts of resources? We know that science is an industry. Uh, we see scientists coming to us nonstop for the last 30, 40 years. So obviously it's an industry that can also build the capacity and strengthen the capacity of indigenous leaders and this is one of the things that we're doing with the Matawara Council. We are taking artists and we are turning them into community researchers and community storytellers. One, because they come from a discipline where their mind is open to creativity. Their mind is open to be able to telling a story and convincing people how to, um, how to come along on the journey and invest in the story that we're, we're doing. I mean, this film I showed you was 35 minutes. Normally they're about 10 minutes. My daughter, who's just finishing her Juris Doctor in Law, is also becoming a, an, an amazing filmmaker. But she's making one and a half minute films that are getting the 15,000, the 30,000 hits because we need to find new ways of communicating with our audience and with our people to bring them on the journey. So in terms of the economics, there's a whole uh, array of economic uh, opportunities that we have demonstrated in this plan that has just been peer reviewed and will be available to all people in the public within the next week. And within that is very, very clear ideas about what the research agenda could be, should be, must be, and where these new economies can be grounded. But first of all, we need to really build the capacity of our young people. We need to redefine what labor is. We need to find a way to create partnerships with philanthropic and private investors um, so that we can show that these alternative economies are real and seriously available if people are coming in with a ethics of care to work with Indigenous people 
uh, one of the things I promote is harvesting renewable energy on Indigenous land through Indigenous hands. So, that, you know, there's, there's a whole range of Indigenous leaders who will, you know, um, share some of this uh, economic development, how we're going to build our workforce, how we're going to partner with a whole range of things. So we have a dream, we're sending the dream out, we're opening our hearts and minds up, and that's why I said this is a global story. If there are international investors, partners looking at investing in this process and our story, we want to hear from you, we want to work with you, we want to share what this land and the river is all about. One of the concerns that comes from a very eminent uh, scientist that I work with on the Australian National University Water Justice Hub is, is saying to me is that the, the way development is projected for the Matawara Fitzroy River is that we are ready to destroy a river system that has been guarded by Indigenous guardians from the beginning of time and we do not know anything about the system before we destroy it. So that's why there's a real need to work with a lot of different people to collaborate because what we are very clear on is that none of us want to live in abject poverty. We all want ways to be able to reach our full potential as human beings, particularly for our young people. And we believe that what we need is starts of conversation. We have just, just uh, as I said, completed our documentation. We have a wide body of evidence to be able to um, shape up future partnerships. But this is an amazing area. I mean, to have a river system with the the uh, largest macro tidal delta in the world shows that there's amazing things happening between the marine environment and the freshwater. The fact that we've got sawfish that grow up to 21 feet in length, you know, start in the river, end up in the sea. This is a place that Western science is still coming to and finding new species. And so it's a blanket of, of, of great opportunity to do great business at a whole range of levels. Rosalie is developing a new training and education program for integrating indigenous knowledge systems with the currently dominant Western scientific land management approaches in ways that are ethical and equitable. And she asks, are you aware of other programs focusing on this in a professional development or tertiary education context? Yeah, um, most recently, um, CSIRO um, in Australia launched what they call a text for how to partner with Indigenous Australians in this country. So Indigenous leaders have all got together and we've produced a document which is available, which I can also send to people called Our Knowledge, Our Way. And so Indigenous leaders have written, there's about you know, several chapters in that to show how do we engage with Indigenous people? How do we value this sunk cost investment of this sense of place, this knowledge, this wisdom? that has showcased that Indigenous Australians in, in Australia have lived together in harmony, have traded, have come from diverse scientific uh, backgrounds, as I said in the thing, pharmaceutical, from engineering, from architecture. I mean, you saw very quickly that in the middle of the Fitzroy River are stone fish traps. And so there's an, a you know, great opportunity. I think the best thing is um, be brave, start a conversation and see where that goes. We have no expectations. We put our things out there. If people like what we want to do and be a part of it, come on down, come and be part of it. But um, there's so much out there that um, I can't do justice in, in the short time that I've got. But um, I think, you know, through the film, through our website, the Matawara Fitzroy River Council website, there is a lot going on and we're publishing and putting things up there. So I guess there's a center point in terms of where do you come to for information, one, you can email me as the chair, but two, you can go on the Matawara Fitzroy River um, website and see all the publications, see the work that we're doing, see who we are collaborating with. Um, and we're just in the process. We've recently become incorporated. We're waiting for deductible gift recipient status. We're partnering with some international people at the moment. And um, as I say, you know, the one of the things is be brave, contact us. This is an open slate. There's beautiful still so much research to be done. And what we're saying is that we're extending our hand of friendship and the gift of the Matawara, which is an active actor in all our work. And we're saying, come on down, try it, see if you like it um, and see where we can go. Thank you. 
That's the question from Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, does the European term commons serve the concepts you work with well? And what are pros and cons of using the term commons? I think, you know, it's interesting because <laughs> I had a question to this from, you know, the panel that I've just joined recently. And one of the things is my country doesn't understand English. The river doesn't understand English. It goes on feeling your relationship with it in terms of how do you engage in it. So for me, the Commons is a frame that, you know, was made very, very powerful through Eleanor Austin's work. And what she did was she recognised the work of Indigenous people globally in framing the Commons. So we know with English language and any language, it's all about the framing. So when you use the word commons, it invites people who have an understanding of what the commons is to bring them inside of a conversation with Aboriginal or Indigenous people. From our perspective, we would say the commons is what we say, country. So we would refer to, that's my country. I have a relationship with my country. I look after my country. I protect my country. So if someone said to me, give me a synonym for the commons, I would say country country as defined by Indigenous people globally. Thank you. I guess the last question then um, can be answered by Charlie. Uh, will the recording of this event be available at a later date? Uh, yes, so, so uh, I will put the recording up probably tomorrow of the conversation we have. And Anne, you'll have to tell me how you want to handle the, uh, the you know, if, if we can put a link to the film, the, the 35 minute film you just showed. Um, but I think we, it sounded like we may still have a conversation about that or um, do, you want, do you want to tell me or give me direction right now what you think we should do? Yeah, I, I think if we can put up the question, you know, the start and the end. And what I would encourage, remember I used the word be brave, be brave. You know, one of the things that somebody said to me the other day, I gave a webinar to um, some architects and, you know, one of the things they said to me was, you know, how do we find Aborigines? <laughs> and I said, look, you just met one and you've now gone past the statistics of 60% of Australians in Australia have not met an Aboriginal person. Can you believe that in, in 2020? So the point I'm saying is that I was just thinking on my feet. And so I think if we put the introduction and the questions up, one of the things I would like to do to the listeners that are out there, and we still got 35 people on the, on the um, webinar, which is a real blessing to me, is I'm putting a challenge to you to contact me. If you want to know about our work, why don't you email me and I will send you the link because then it gives me a connection because this is all about relationship so i would say put the questions up at the at the beginning and the and the sorry the introduction at the beginning and the questions at the end and right now before we decide to put it up and make the link public i'd say those of you that are interested send me an email talk to me let's have a conversation let's see where this might go and can go and as I said, we have no expectation that if you contact me that you're going to give me something. This is about sharing. This is about a different way to see how we can build global relationships across the world. So right now I'd be saying, yep, have a look at that. Come to uh, that. But please um, get to know us. Get to know who we are. So thank you all. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you all for still being there, 35 of you. Um, it's very, very, very lovely to, you know, hear from all of you and, um, yeah, tune in, contact me, be brave. The Madurawara belongs to all of us and it is indeed a commons. Um, and I think Eleanor Ostrom would be very proud of the work that we're doing and not yeah. just here in Australia, but in New Zealand and right across the globe, First Nations people, Indigenous people, we need to be factored into this engagement, this conversation. Um, any partnerships that are, are happening out there that do not have Indigenous people is doomed to fail because you are missing an amazing invitation and a gift of wisdom and love to help inform your practice. 
So thank you very much. So, so Anne, thank you so much. Um, I think there were a couple other questions that were in chat that we didn't get to, but what I'm gonna do is copy those along with the names, hopefully you'll know the names, um, and I'll send you those via email. Uh, um, at this point, I'm going to, i just like to close by um, showing a couple, uh, just to let you know about other things that are happening with World Commons Week this week. Uh, we've already had a, uh, the North America keynote um, that's been completed. That recording is available and all the recordings will be available for the other keynotes at the uh, location at the bottom of the screen. Um, we had uh, Latin America was uh, on Saturday um, and uh, that's available again uh, online. Uh, this morning we had uh, the Africa keynote um, speaker. Uh, upcoming on October 7th, we're having the European speaker uh, and then, sorry, <laughs> and then we have, I can't get my fingers to work right. Um, then we have China um, coming up also on the 7th. That will actually be in Chinese. And then this one I'm in particularly excited about, and it's the first time we've done it in the three years we've done World Commons Week. This is uh, uh, the ISC Early Career Network. Uh, it's young academics um, that are uh, really mobilizing now, and they've put together a two-hour panel on October 8th. Um, so I hope we'll have um, attendees rooting them on and, and yeah, cheering on the, the, the new group of academics coming. And then we'll close at Asia um, with this talk by uh, Eileen Delaney. And um, we, this year, you know, with a global pandemic, it's been a little different. But we also have had these uh, local online events, or local events going on. In this year, because of the pandemic, they're mostly online, but we're growing every year. We've now beaten the, the number of participant locations from last year. So we hope we'll keep this, this going year to year. And I guess I'm just planting the seed uh, for 2021 for you to consider um, people in the audience to consider doing some event that's related to this that'll be in October. Um, and speaking of October next year, the IESC Biennial Conference is happening. Uh, we don't know whether it'll be in person or online, um, but that's at Arizona State University on the left are the dates for submissions. And then on the right, um, we're doing, because of the pandemic and uh, we're doing a, a variety of different um, uh, smaller events on different commons areas. So um, keep an eye on the iescommons.org website if you want to participate in any of these. Um, as, I, as I close, um, I just want to say, um, you know, I think this, for me, this was a, a real honor um, to take this time and to display this film, Anne, and your work. Um, uh, and I think this really shows how we can use this platform to really get messages out globally. Uh, and we had a really nice uh, attendee, uh, uh, attendees here. Um, so I, I just wanna say thank you um, to Andreas for organizing this, this keynote. Um, thank you to the audience for um, being here and, uh, and going long, um, and especially to Dr. Polino for preparing and, and showing this great film and the, and the Q&A afterwards. Uh, we don't have any way to clap, but feel free in the um, participants window to raise your hand and we'll give her a high five. <laughs> and, and you'll see that there's a bunch of people raising hands. So this concludes uh, the IESC Oceana region. Wow, look at those hands. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of them. Um, uh, this concludes the Oceana region uh, keynote webinar. On behalf of IESC and the World Commons Week and the organizing team, thank you all for attending. And whatever time zone you're in, I hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Very nice, Andreas. Yeah, thanks, Sunday, for.